are so excited to be worshiping with you. We, I don't know if you've joined from either YouTube or Facebook or jerseychurch.tv, but we are excited to worship with you this morning. If you're on Facebook, just leave a comment. We'd love to, just to connect with you and, and know that you are watching with us this morning. We're going to send it over to our chapel worship service this morning. Good morning. You can all have a seat. We have some announcements.
Good morning, church. It is so great to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. If you are new with us, we want to say welcome. We are so glad that you are here. We'd love to meet you after service at our welcome area in our main lobby. We have a gift for you, and we'd love to answer any questions you might have about Jersey. If you're new with us and you're joining online, we are so thankful that you are watching with us. If you can help us out by texting the word NEW to 740-457-1525, we're going to send you a connect card, and then if you can fill that out for us, that will help us be able to connect with you. On September, Sunday, September 15th, we are beginning a new sermon series that we're calling What is the Church? We're going to be going through the book of Acts together and looking at the church in the simplest of forms, what it really is. And so if you are, it's not just a sermon series, it's also a grow group study. So if you are unconnected to a grow group, we would love to get you connected. You can see us at our next steps table out there in the main lobby. Or you can get on our website, jerseychurch.org slash the church. We'd be able to help you get connected to a grow group study this fall for this sermon series. Also, starting Wednesday, uh, the 28th of August, we talked about this last week. We're beginning our, our, our study, um, our different groups and our different classes that we have in our Wednesday night programming. So we would love for you to get connected to that. Uh, if you haven't been connected before, it's a great way to really grow in, obviously, our faith, but also grow in community with others as well. And that also begins our kids' ministry programming on that night. And I know student ministry is going to have a kickoff event that evening as well. And then finally, on, on Saturday, August 24th, is our food, fun, and fireworks. Did I get the order right? I did. I always mess up the order of those words. But we're really looking forward to that evening. Tons of food trucks, some really great fireworks. What a night to invite your friends, your neighbors. It's just an awesome uh, uh, event. And so we are looking forward to being out there with you guys on that evening. Let's pray before we continue in our service. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you to be able to gather here today with other believers. Lord, to worship your name, to study your word. Father, we just pray that as we, as we continue on in this service today, Lord, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll convict us where needed. Father, that we will leave here today changed by you and through the work of the Holy Spirit. God, we praise you and we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Jesus truly is our all in all. Amen? Amen. He's our everything. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9. Um, my family had an interesting experience over the last couple weeks. We, uh, we've moved into our home. We've been there for about four or five months. And uh, we, um, we had some, just some things happening in the family. And we thought, you know, we need to check to see if there is mold in our home. You know, a couple sicknesses, a couple things that just didn't seem right. So we brought in the mold, uh, uh, the mold mentors. That was the company we used. And they ran a test, and they sent it back to us, and a list of things that I don't understand, right? Like, just all these, I mean, you're kind of sending, like, why would you send me this? I can't read any of this. But I can, I do know my colors. And there were three things listed out in red. And I looked at Mary, and I said, I think that's bad. <laughs> sure enough, the company calls us and says, so yes, you do have mold, and, and we would recommend that you uh, get it remediated. And, and, you know, we, we, we talked to them about it, and Mary and I talked about it because we're like, okay, well, do we do this? Do we not do this? Well, when you know you have mold in your home, then all of a sudden you start to get the sniffles, right? And you start to think about it, and, and you, you, you got to take care of it. It's not something you let sit. If you let it sit, it gets what? Worse. Yeah. And so then these two guys show up. They're going to they're gonna do the remediation for us. They're super nice. They go into the bathroom. And we're talking, and, and I, I said, look, you need to tear up whatever you need to tear up to go as far as you need to go to get it all. And he said, well, that was our plan. And, and he said this, and he explains how they're going to do it. This obviously isn't their first rodeo. And so they get in there, and they do the whole remediation. My bathroom's taped off right now. And, and, and at the end of the day, they're going to have gotten all the mold out of my home, my family won't be breathing it in. My family won't be dealing with it. And we'll have to, we'll have to do some fixing up in the bathroom, but it will all be gone. And that's, that's eventually where we want to get. Every, nobody wants a home with mold in it. So you have to deal with it when it comes. Well, today we're going to talk about something else that we have to deal with it when we find it in our lives. We're going to have to deal with, with what, it, what, what it does to us. We're going to have to deal with the worst parts of it. And, and what we're going to talk about today is sin. Now, before you say, great, one more sermon on sin in church, where I'm going to leave feeling awful about myself. Remember, the point of this series is to talk about the hope that we see from the book of Genesis. And what we're going to see today is that God does deal with sin, but he always gives hope. But we must deal with sin and then have our hope in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So let's turn to, to Genesis chapter 9, verses, uh, we're going to start in verse 18. This is continuing on from last week. If you remember, we went through the first 17 verses last week. And the, the point of that uh, passage is that God made the covenant with Noah, with his sons, with the animals, and with all the generations after Noah and his sons. And it was a covenant where it showed God valued us. God values our life. God values you because he's made you in his image. And then coming out of that passage then, we go into what happens right after that. And if you recall, the first 17 verses reflected the creation, where, where it was like a restart after the flood. God created everything in Genesis 1 and 2, and then what we saw at the beginning of Genesis chapter 9 after the flood was kind of God doing a restart. What we're going to see today in the second half of the chapter, is another fall. Remember, there, the creation happened in chapters Genesis 1 and 2, and then the fall came in chapter 3, and then we saw it's kind of um, how it went to the core in chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. We're going to see another version of that here. Uh, so that's, that's where we fall. But let me read the first two verses here. In verse 18 it says, Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were Noah's sons, and from them the whole earth was populated. Okay, so we've seen a couple times these three men, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, it talks about them in Noah's, in the genealogy in chapter 5. It talks about them as Noah's getting ready to uh, build the ark. It's talking about them as Noah is going on to the ark. So, so this would not be the first time that we've seen these three names. And these are Noah's sons. But there is a fourth name that is added. And it's Ham's son, Canaan. So a grandson of Noah. 
Now we're going to get into him in a little bit here, but we want to see that, that from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the whole earth was populated. Remember how uh, in, in the beginning of chapter 9, God's told his, uh, Noah and his family to be fruitful and what? Multiply and fill the earth. Well, what he's now saying is that the earth is going to be repopulated through these three guys. And so God's will is going to be accomplished through these three men. But there's a grandson. And the grandson, he, he's important to notice here. Because five times he'll be mentioned in the next ten verses. When something is mentioned over and over and over again in a short time like that, it's probably significant. You always want to pay attention to it, no matter what word it is. When you're reading the Bible and you keep seeing the same word over and over in a passage, that means God's trying to make a point. But who is Canaan besides Ham's grandson? How would you like to have the name Ham? Anybody? I just, I, it's, every time I say it, I just, I got Porky the pig in my mind, right? But he's Ham's grandson. What, what do we know about Cain? Well, if we, we're not going to, we're not going to take time to do it, but, but Genesis chapter 10 uh, is uh, some of the genealogies that come out of Shem, Japheth, and Ham. They, they, it shows all the sons that they had, but it doesn't give necessarily a genealogy, a full genealogy for each son. But we do have one for Canaan. In verse 15, it talks about how Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, as well as, and I want you to notice that the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Arakites, the Sinites, the Aravidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamarathites, and afterwards the Canaanite clan scattered. You like how I got those names? You guys go home and try to read those to yourself. That was difficult. Um, but the, the name, you notice how he goes from, uh, how the passage goes from the, the children that Canaan had to tribe, the names of tribes, the names of clans. What we'll see actually in, in Genesis chapter 10 is, is that it's, it's not necessarily chronological. It's giving you a flash forward. It's giving you a peek into the future. And the future shows that, that, uh, that Canaan, from him, came the tribes that filled the land of what? Canaan, where Israel would eventually settle. So the, the significance of Canaan is that from him will come the tribes that fill the promised land that God promises to Israel. And when Israel goes into the, uh, the land of Canaan, it will drive out these tribes because they have fallen away from the Lord. All right, so there's something significant about that, and we're going to get to it here in a moment. But we just have to see that you got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Those are the main characters in the story. And then you have the grandson of, of Ham named Canaan, and it's through them that the earth will be repopulated. Verse 20. Let's look at verse 20 here. Noah, as a man of the soil, began by planting a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a cloak and placed it over both their shoulders, and walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father naked. All right, so this is a tough passage. You've probably heard a lot of different things talked about it. There's a lot of questions that could be asked about it. But what you first have to do is remember, when you're studying the Bible, we cannot take our, our uh, 20, what is it, uh, 21st century, no, 22nd century, are we in the 20th? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's going to take me longer to figure it out than it actually matters. We can't take our modern Western mind and put it over the, the biblical words. Because who wrote Genesis but Moses? Where did Moses live? Not, not this time America, not modern day America. He lived in the ancient time of the Middle East. And who were the readers? People who lived in the ancient time in the Middle East. So we have to look at it from their perspective. All right? And, and so that's where, that's the first step you have to take when you're reading a passage like this. Because there are lots of questions, right? There are lots of questions. But let's just, let's just cover the story at its basic form. Noah comes out of the ark, he plants uh, a vineyard, and then he gets, drinks from it and gets drunk. He makes wine and he gets drunk. And when he's drunk, he takes his clothes off. He makes an unwise decision, he's in his tent, he takes his clothes off. Ham, his son, comes into his tent, sees him, and then leaves and goes tells his brothers. 
His brothers respond by putting a blanket over their shoulder, walking backwards so as not to see their father's nakedness, and, then it cover, and he covers them. Now, as we'll go on to see, when Noah wakes up, he is upset with Ham, but not with Japheth and Shem, which means that the whole point of the passage, the, 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 the core of this story is that Ham messed up. We'll talk about what that means, but we have to start there. Ham is in the wrong. Shem and Jabeth are in the right. All right, that's the, that's the premise of the story. Now, the questions come into, well, Noah, Noah here is drunk, but he doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to condemn it, right? It's, it's not focusing on Noah being drunk. It's focusing on the actions of his sons. Now, what that means is, is, um, is that Noah in this story, that, that's not the main point. Now, we can see through the rest of Scripture that drunkenness is condemned. You, you go to Genesis chapter 5 where uh, Paul's listing out the, the activities of the flesh and drunkenness is one of them. Right? It's not an activity of the Holy Spirit. It's an activity of the flesh. So this is not necessarily a passage I would turn to to encourage you not to get drunk. Um, there are other passages, but for some reason they didn't want to deal with it here. What we can say, though, is that being drunk did not seem to fit Noah's character of being righteous and blameless. So something has gone wrong, and what it means is Noah is not perfect. Noah is not perfect. And he, so he plants a vineyard, drinks from it, and he gets drunk. And one, one commentator, I love this quote, says, uh, With the opportunity to start an ideal society, Noah is found drunk in his tent. So it may not condemn it, but there doesn't seem to be anything good about it. And actually, what we'll see is this is the first reflection of the fall from Genesis chapter 3. The fall came because Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And then we see eventually that because they disobeyed God, a scenario was created where their children disobeyed God. Well, Noah gets drunk, and then a scenario is created where his son does something inappropriate. So let's continue. So Noah gets drunk, and he's in his tent, and he, and he uncovered himself inside his tent. Verse 22. Ham, the father of Canaan, again, notice how it mentions Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Now, there has been a lot of stuff talked about of what this verse means. I, I don't have time to go into all of it. But what I believe it means and what I've found multiple commentaries agree with me on, and, and so I'm not making this argument up, is that it means nothing more than Ham, Ham stuck his head in Noah's tent and saw that he had no clothes on. Some people have believed it to be sexual in nature because it's talking about nakedness. But, but the way that uh, the nakedness came about was Noah took his own clothes off. When in, whenever nakedness in Hebrew is referring to something sexual or uncovering somebody's nakedness is referring to something sexual, it's when one person uncovers another person's nakedness. So I think what we have here is not a sexual encounter of any kind. What we have here is Noah got drunk, made a bad decision, and took his clothes off, and then Ham stuck his head in Noah's tent. But the issue here comes when it says, and then Ham left and told his brothers outside. So Ham goes in, looks at his father's drunken state and being naked, goes outside, and it says told his brothers. That word for told means to announce to report, to propose something going on. It's not just a, hey, did you see the bad decision dad made? It's, it's not of going looking for advice. It's not a going going, hey, just stay away from dad for a bit. He's, he's not doing well. This is clearly a ham sticks his head in and then makes an announcement to the world. Look, look at how foolish my dad is. Look what my dad has done. And it's, it's a disrespectful announcement. And so when Ham sees what his father has done and the state of his father, he announces it to the world. But what do Shem and Japheth do? It says, then they took a cloak or a garment, a blanket, and placed it on their shoulders. And walking backward, walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Now, it, it, actually, that he, the, the word for backward in, here is, in the Hebrew is here twice. And when it says their faces were turned away... It actually says their faces were turned backward. 
So they walked backward, their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father naked. Now, the, the grammar of this, mean, um, it shows that when it says, it's, it's listed as they were walking backward, they were facing backward. It's talking about like actions that are happening. But when it comes to the last of this sentence where it says they did not see their fathers naked, it's a firm announcement. It is something that has happened. It is not being completed. It is completed. They did not at all look at their father's nakedness. So you have three sons. One of them looks and makes an announcement. The other two respectfully walk backwards and do not see it. And then Noah wakes up, and you can see in verse 24, it says, When Noah awoke from his drinking and learned what his youngest, him, son, had done, he said to him, and then we're going to go into the, the, Noah's response, but he is, he is upset with him. So the whole passage is looking at Shem and Japheth as the ones who are honoring their father and Ham as the one who is dishonoring his father. Then in the last two, so when Noah wakes up and he, he sees what Ham's done, verse 25 said, uh, he, he cursed Canaan. He says, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. That means he will be the slave of slaves. He will be a slave to slaves. And verse 26 says, he also said... Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Let God extend Japheth. Let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. So you see a blessing and a curse based upon somebody's sin. Where else do we see this? But we see it with Cain. We see Cain, after he sinned, he was cursed. Now we have Ham and Canaan cursed because of their sin. Now, you would look at this and you'd go, wait a second. It was, if you remember, right, it was Ham who stuck his head in the tent, not Canaan. So why is Canaan getting (laughs) cursed because of what his dad did? Well, if you think about it, that happens a lot. You think about the, uh, the parents who rack up a lot of debt, and as they then get older, they pass away. And who's dealt, who has, who's left to deal with their debt? Their sons and daughters. You think about an an abusive mother or father. Even if the child makes it out of the home, there will be emotional scars. There will be physical scars. Or if you go further, think about Nazi Germany, right? Think about how long it took that country to overcome the, the atrocities committed by the Nazis in the Holocaust. The sins of a previous generation get passed down. The consequences get passed down to the next generation. That's just a reality. So when Noah looks and he looks at Ham and he curses Canaan, I want you to notice the the curse is not a moral curse. The curse is a societal curse. So he says Cain is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves, a societal position. He doesn't say, look at Cain. Cain is cursed. He will forever sin and forever be doing activities like this. No, it's a society position. Now, why is that important? Um, This is a lot of information, isn't it? Just go with me. (laughs) Just keep going with me. We'll get there. Um, Why is this important? Well, God does not condemn everybody in Cain's line to hell. But he does put them, he does make them deal with the consequences of their father's actions. And so what happens? Well, if, if, if we turn to Leviticus 18, Leviticus 18 here. Leviticus 18 is a list of the sexual sins that Israel is supposed to avoid. But it, as it's listing them out, at the very end, in verse 24, Moses says, Do not defile yourself by any of these practices, for the nations... I am driving out before you have defiled themselves by all these things. And then in verse 26, but you are to keep my statutes and ordinances. You must not commit any of these detestable acts, not the native or the alien who resides among you. For the people who were in the land prior to you have committed all these detestable acts and the land has become defiled. So as Israel is taking over the land, God is saying, look, you don't behave this way. 
You don't behave this way because the nations before you that you are driving out, they behaved this way. And remember, who are the nations that came before them? The Canaanites. So when Noah goes to curse his son for an action that his son committed, he curses Canaan, the grandson. And I think it's because Noah looked at the grandson and said, you have a characteristic that bends you this way. You have a characteristic where you don't honor people, you dishonor people. And you exploit their nakedness. You exploit them in so many different ways. And you will defile the land because of your actions. And so Noah curses Cain by name. And then when Israel goes in, that curse comes to fruition that the Canaanites become the mortal enemies of Israel. But there is hope. There is hope. And there's hope even for the Canaanites. There's hope even for the Canaanites. Verse 26. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. So Shem, uh, we, uh, we don't have time to do this, but if we go into chapter 10, I read a bunch of those difficult names again. Eventually, Shem's line gets to Abraham. And then we all know that Abraham gets to Jesus. Right? So in the act of cursing the Canaanites, he blesses Shem and Shem's line will then bless the entire world through Jesus Christ. Now, what I said too is, is true. The, the, the curse here is a societal curse. It is not a moral curse. We have a story of a lady named Rahab. Anybody remember Rahab? Anybody? All right, Rahab. What city did Rahab live in? Jericho. Everybody, yeah. The simplest questions are always the most difficult to answer, right? Because you're like, it's so easy. I know it. No. Rahab lived in Jericho. Remember, Joshua sent spies into Jericho. They go in and they find Rahab. Rahab fears God, has faith in God, hides the spies so her government doesn't catch them and kill them, and then sends them home. And the, the spies say, look, if you leave the cord that she lowered them down with, if you leave the cord out the window, you'll survive when we attack the city. And she has faith, and she does, and she survives. Rahab was from Jericho. Jericho is a Canaanite city. So we have to see, in this curse, it was a societal curse, but it wasn't a moral curse. The immorality that came about because of the Canaanites was their decision. But any of them at any point could have followed the Lord. We have to remember that, that, that God does deal with sin. God does deal with sin, but he has given us hope to find a way out. He has not cursed anybody to the point where they can never turn back to him. What Ham did, what Canaan did was wrong, and God punished it. But God punishes all of our sin. But he provides a way out. He provides a way out, and that way out is through Jesus Christ. The way out is through Jesus Christ. If you just read through the scriptures at all, you see that everything has hope because God is a God of hope. And all of our hope it leads to, points to, is found in Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to the earth, he said his mission was in Matthew chapter 1 was to save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save us from that which condemns us. Jesus came to save us from our greatest problem. And when he came in Matthew 9, it says that he did not come to seek the sinner or the righteous, but the sinner. He came looking for us. And then Luke 19, it says that he, he came to seek and to save those who were lost. I love 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, it says. Uh, Paul says he passes on to us that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says that God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that beautiful? That we become the righteousness of God because Jesus became our sin. God does condemn sin. In every way, shape, and form. But he has given us hope in Jesus Christ. So now, what do we do with our sin here and now? What do we do with our sin today? 
Well, and so there's, there's three things. God has taken care of our sin. First and foremost, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ because that heals you of all the problems. But then you're going to leave today and you're going to have an issue with sin that you fight the rest of your life. And so there's three things. First of all, there's those situations when we enter into life where there's potential that we could sin. And that's called temptation. Temptation comes at us sometimes in known situations. We can see it coming. And sometimes in unknown situations. It surprises us. And, in, and when you have temptation, what you got to do is you have to have a plan. You have to have a plan. So I'm coaching Little League football. Baseball's done, on to Little League football, right? And when I was going through the training, you have to take these classes so they, they think you know what you're talking about. And so you're taking these classes, and, and I'm going through them. And you know what? I've done it for a couple of years now, so a lot of times I just kind of fast-forward the videos. Don't tell anybody. But you can listen to them on real fast speed, and it still counts. But I was watching one, and they said something I'd never heard before. And it says, when you're teaching your team to tackle, teach every kid to have a plan of what they're going to do when they have to make a tackle. And I was like, that's fascinating. And I kind of slowed down at that point. And, and, and it's actually a great coaching technique. When I'm looking at these fifth graders, I'm telling them, hey, listen, you got to have a plan of what you're going to do when you're on the field. Don't just get out there and guess what you're going to do. Don't just get out there and fly around. Because I told them, like, that's how you get hurt. And I don't want you to get hurt. And so when we're teaching them to tackle, we're teaching them to have a plan. Now, I can't give them a plan for every single scenario that will happen on that football field. But I can give them a basic plan on some basic plays so that when certain things happen that apply across the board, they'll know what to do. The same thing applies for temptation. I can't give you a plan that will get you through every temptation, but you guys know where you get tempted the most. And so you can make a plan of what you're going to do the next time you're in that scenario. Maybe it's walk away. Maybe you just choose not to say anything. Maybe you have a Bible verse that you recite in your head. Maybe you avoid the situation altogether. You know, you know, an alcoholic knows he needs to avoid a bar, right? You know, you just, maybe you know some of those things. But when, for us to deal with the sin in our life, we got to deal with the temptation. Which means have a plan when the temptation comes at you of what you're going to do. The second thing you can do is you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 says, Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are sin. But if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry those out. I love the, the verse out of Isaiah 30, 21. It says, Whenever you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear this command behind you. This is the way. Walk in it that's the holy spirit's promise to speak to you cultivate that listening to the holy spirit and you say well matt how do i do that well you gotta know the spirit's voice and guys it's not that complicated but it takes time i can stand up here and tell you right now i hear the holy spirit's voice throughout my week I'm not a special human being there's nothing special about my body i am a human just like you I've just spent time trying to cultivate listening to the Holy Spirit. And the best way you can do that is through prayer and reading the Bible. Spend time with the Lord in prayer. Spend time reading the Bible and you begin to recognize the Holy Spirit's voice. Because uh, John talks about in chapter 14 how when we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit then dwells in us. Christ said, look, when I leave, I'm going to send you the counselor, the Holy Spirit. So if you accept Christ, you have the Holy Spirit and he is speaking to you. You just got to cultivate it. Through prayer and reading the Bible. And when you cultivate it, that's when the Spirit will begin to speak to you. Don't go there. Don't do that. And that's when you can begin to deal with sin. So you deal with sin through making a plan for temptation. You deal with sin by listening to the Holy Spirit. And, then, and, when, well, and when you listen to the Holy Spirit, it takes humility and trust. Because you've got to give up what you want. And you've got to trust that what God has is better for you. Uh, Ulysses Grant, while he was a general in the Union Army, was going to a banquet in his honor. And he was walking down the sidewalk, and, and there was a, it was raining, so he had an umbrella. And there was this other man walking down the sidewalk, and they were going the same direction. So Ulysses Grant offers him to share his umbrella. And, of course, they get into conversation, and, and they're moving the same direction. This guy was going to the same banquet that uh, Grant was going to uh, in honor of Grant. 
And the man said, you know, I've never met this Ulysses Grant. And everybody talks about him. But frankly, I think he's overrated. <laughs> to which Grant responded with, you know, sir, I agree with you. <laughs> right? Humility. Not overrating yourself. Not focusing on yourself. But true humility is giving glory to God. And then trust. Trusting the Holy Spirit is going to tell you that what's best for you. It's similar to uh, this guy named Blondin. He was, he was crossing over Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And he did it multiple times. And then he did it with a wheelbarrow. And some of you might have heard this story. So he gets back. And the crowd is just ooing and eyeing over, over his ability to cross back and forth. And he looks at one of the bystanders. He goes, do you think I could do this with something in the wheelbarrow? And the guy goes, yes, I do. He goes, then get in. <laughs> trust. You can say you trust, but until you do what God's asking you to do, you don't trust that what he says to you is what's best for you. When we listen to the Holy Spirit, it takes humility Humility and trust. So we make a plan for temptation. We're humble and we trust God and we listen to the Spirit. And then the final one is that, guys, when we mess up, you admit that you're wrong. When you sin against the Lord, just say, Lord, I, I'm wrong. I was wrong there. I was wrong there. You know, when, when my wife and I do premarital counseling, we're doing uh, it with a couple right now, we always go through two things. We cover a lot, but we always go through two things. Conflict and communication. Because if you're married, you're going to have a conflict and you're going to have to communicate about it, right? There are two skills that every married couple needs to have. And, and when we meld those together and we're teaching them to communicate through conflict, the best phrase that we have found is say, look, when you finally realize that you're the one who's wrong, just pause, take a deep breath, and go, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. Those are great words. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. And we can use those with the Lord too. God, I'm sorry. I was wrong when I did, when I said, when I acted that way, when I thought that. Please forgive me. And 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will always forgive you. So we make a plan to face temptation. And then we trust and humbly, humbly trust the Holy Spirit. And then we admit when we're wrong. That's how we deal with sin. Christ has dealt with the eternal issue. But as we live day to day, that's how we deal with the sins in our life. Let me pray. Heavenly me, Father, I lift up to you this, uh, this congregation God, you are good, you love us, you've watched over us, you sent Jesus to save us. Lord, you have dealt with the eternal consequences of our sin. But Lord, as we leave here today and temptation comes and our flesh creeps up in us and, and we're, we, we, we have that, that itch to do something we know we shouldn't, Lord, help us to look to you. Help us to trust you, humbly trust you. Help us to make a plan for what we're going to do and to do the right thing. And Lord, for those times when we don't, quickly remind us that you're a forgiving and loving God. Let us not dwell in our sin, but let's turn to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We just want to give you an opportunity before we leave here just to, to respond to what God has done in your life this morning, where the Holy Spirit's been working and moving. We want to hear from you. We want to know what God is doing. You can send the church an email. You can give us a call uh, during the week when we're in the offices, or you can even just send us a text. We want to hear how God is working and moving in your life. We thank you for worshiping with us, and we're already excited to worship again with you next weekend. Have a great week.